Courageous Church. We are so glad you're here with us this morning, whether you're with us in person or online, you're part of our church family. Uh, we're thankful for you, we pray for you, and we are really excited about the different stories of life that are coming out of our church community right now. There's some really exciting things happening. And next week we get to have our next Bold Love Sunday. So next week during this time block, during on Sunday morning, we're going to be serving um, our neighbors together and we'll have an announcement about that after this message and you'll learn more about how you can get involved. So at the end of this message, make sure you stick around to get details on that. Uh, I'd love for each and every one of you to get to be involved in loving others alongside us. Um, it's, it's a beautiful thing when we get to do that together as a church community. Uh, but for today, we've been going through our series on the Old Testament, learning about the story of the Bible and how Jesus fits into that and how the story of Jesus is woven all throughout the Old Testament. And we've been learning about how it applies to our lives today. And last week, Tim talked about King David. And today I'm gonna talk about the era in Israel's history where they were ruled by kings in books uh, first and second Kings. But first, I was thinking about when I was preparing this message for you all, I was thinking about when Tim and I were called to ministry. I remember those moments of calling so clearly. I remember the moment when I knew I was going to be a pastor. I remember the moment where I knew God was calling Tim and I to plant a church. I remember the moment when we said yes to moving to Seattle. I remember the, the moment when I, when I knew God was calling me to step into this position as a leader of Courageous Church. There's these, these moments in our lives where God calls us into something significant, a piece of who he's made us to be. And to respond requires a faith step. To respond fully really requires a yes of your whole heart. Even when you can't see all of how everything's going to work out. And we, we talked about that concept with Abraham, right? Where God called him into an unknown land and told him to follow him. And, you know, even in the difficult moments, because... Uh, in case you didn't know, starting a church, being pastors isn't always easy. <laughs> um, but even in the moments that are difficult, Tim and I are both so aware that nothing else this world could offer is worth even looking back for. I mean, sure, we could have gone to college to get degrees and something that would have paid a lot more money. Like we could have done a lot of different things. We could have stayed living close to family. There are things we could have done that would have been easier. But responding to the call of God, wholeheartedly taking a step out in faith to follow him is so worth it. And in Luke 9 verse 62, it says, but Jesus told him anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. And that's this picture of someone who who's plowing a field and they had to like keep looking forward to plow in a straight line, right? And anyone that it's thinking about like following God and going in that straight line towards God. Anyone who's going like this, looking back at the life they left behind is not a fit for the kingdom of God. Similarly, in Philippians 3, Paul's talking about the, the different things he's faced as a leader in the church and as part of his call to follow God. And in verses 7 through the beginning of verse 9, he says, I once thought these things in his old life were valuable. But now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared to the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. 
And for those of us that have made the decision to follow Jesus, we've discovered the beauty of relationship with God. We've, we've discovered how worth it it is. But even if you've followed God for a long time, sometimes we still second guess. Sometimes we can still be like the Israelites in the wilderness that we talked about earlier in the series, how they would look back at their life in slavery and think of it as freedom. Can't we do the same thing sometimes? Whether it was the ability to have acceptance from the world because we were partying and doing all the things the world does. Whether it was lack of responsibility that came prior to say being a parent, entering a new career, entering college, entering adulthood. <laughs> Maybe it was a, a sense of freedom when you think back in your mind to prior to your marriage. And you almost look back at old days of like, oh, there was freedom back then. Maybe it's thinking about the time that before you were a leader, before you took the step into a calling that called you to more, a calling to live for something greater than yourself. But the thing is, is that Jesus truly gives us freedom and the things he calls us to give us freedom and the, the abundant life that he has for us. But when he calls us into freedom, he calls us to give our whole heart. Not to live for ourselves anymore, but, but he gives us a calling. He reveals the identity he made us with and he gives us a purpose worth living for and worth dying for. But you see, you have an enemy of your soul, Satan, who's very real, who wants you to think he's not real, but a very real enemy that wants to get you to believe that freedom is what you left behind. But just like Adam and Eve in the garden, the enemy lied to them to try to get them to want to be the God of their own life. And he wants to do the same with you. So that you look at your life with God, the new life that you're being called to step into. So you look at that as restricted. So that you look at that as slavery. When in reality, that's where freedom is. And he wants you to get to look backwards as that's what freedom when that's where slavery was. But to truly be all in with your relationship with God, there is so much life, fulfillment, beauty, and freedom. Not that everything's easy, but there's so much life to be had. So much intimacy with your creator. So much that's worth it. But in order to be able to truly step into that, you have to realize that nothing this world can offer is worth looking back for. Nothing this world has to offer is even worth comparing to what God has ahead of you. Now today, like I said, we're talking about first and second kings, and these are a record of the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah. And, and I say Israel and Judah because in the book of Kings, the 12 tribes of Israel get split. There's a division. So there's the upper 10 tribes and the lower 10 tribes, which are Israel and Judah. Um, but these are the kings of Israel and Judah. It's a, a record of, of the ones that were good, the ones that were bad. Um, Israel had wanted a human king like the nations around them. They didn't want God to be their king. And eventually God let them have what they wanted. And he he warned them ahead of time of like, You're, the kings that lead you aren't always going to be good kings. Some of them are going to be harsh and this is what it's going to look like having kings. And people wanted a king and the first three kings, we see the record of Saul who uh, Tim talked about Saul and David last week, uh, Saul had a heart that was for himself, not for God. Uh, we see David who, although he was imperfect, he made some bad mistakes. David is widely known as the king whose heart was like God's. God said that David has had a heart like his. 
David was pleasing to God. And then there was Solomon. Um, and David is kind of the, the standard the king, other kings are compared to. Like, did they have a heart like David whose, whose heart was fully sold out to God? Um, and then there came Solomon, who is David's son. And Solomon was actually known as the wisest man who ever lived. God gave him wisdom, he gave him wealth, and he actually was the one to build a permanent temple for God's people to worship in. But at the end of his life, we see that his heart was turned from God because he had a lot of love for women and married a lot of women who worshiped other gods. And at the end of his life, his heart was turned um, towards these his wives' gods. So even, even the most wise man that ever lived still, like his heart when not fully devoted to God didn't stay true uh, to God. Um, and we can learn a lot from, from Solomon. Because to truly live all in with God, you have to realize, right, that nothing in this, this world can offer is worth compromising for, is worth sharing your heart with, or is worth looking back for. The kings that led God's people throughout this record in the books of kings, uh, they were all measured by whether they had a heart like David's and did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, or whether they did what was evil in the Lord's sight. Right, David loved God with his whole heart. But unfortunately, we see that most of the kings that ruled God's people were evil. They didn't have hearts like David. In fact, all of the kings of Israel, the upper 10 tribes, um, all of them were considered evil. Some of the kings of Judah were considered good. And this, this being a good king, being a good leader of God's people was defined by the facts that they, they followed God's law, they worshiped the Lord, and they called the people they led to worship the Lord. They got rid of evil in the land. While the other kings commonly worshiped other gods and encouraged others to do the same, they rejected the Lord. They disobeyed him and their, their hearts were compromised. And for the majority of this period of the time of kings, instead of remembering the God who freed them as a nation, the kings and leaders, and they led the nation along with them, they spent their time chasing after what this world had to offer. But in the midst of the story of First and Second Kings are the stories of Elijah and Elisha. And it's Elisha that I really wanna take a minute to talk about today. So to get them straight, Elijah came first, okay? And he was a prophet. A prophet was someone sent by God to speak on God's behalf to his people. Elijah was used by God to call out King Ahab, who was a horribly evil king. Um, he told King Ahab that because of his evil, there was going to be a drought in the land, and there was for years. He was the one who prayed to God for rain after it was time for the drought to be done, and a torrential rainstorm came. Um, he outran horses when that rainstorm came. He had a contest on Mount Carmel where he showed that all the prophets of Baal, this false god, that, that he showed that they were worshiping a false god and showed that God was a true god by calling fire down from heaven on the sacrifice for God while the prophets from Baal couldn't call down fire from their God. And there's these amazing stories in the story of Elisha, in a story of Elijah. The story of Elisha, see, yeah. So, <laughs> so Elijah came first. There's these amazing stories in his life. But God tells Elijah, um, he spoke directly to him and, and he tells Elijah at one point in his story that and now's the time to appoint your successor and he's gonna walk with you and you're gonna teach him. And eventually he's gonna take over your position as prophet to Israel. Um, and Elisha is the successor that he calls him to appoint. And I, I want to key in today on this, the hinge point of this message, the part I want you to see is what happens 
when Elisha is called, the way he responds to his calling. So we're going to look at 1 Kings 19, verse 19 through 21. It says, So Elijah went and found Elisha, son of Shaphat, plowing a field. There were 12 teams of oxen in the field, and Elisha was plowing the 12th team. Elijah went over to him and threw his cloak across his shoulders and then walked away. Elisha left the oxen standing there, ran after Elijah and said to him, first let me go and kiss my father and mother good go goodbye, and then I will go with you. Elijah replied, go on back, but think about what I have done to you. So Elisha returned to his oxen and slaughtered them. He used the wood from the plow to build a fire to roast their flesh. He passed around the meat to the townspeople and they all ate. Then he went with Elijah as his assistant. So Elijah comes, throws his cloak over, Elijah comes, throws his cloak over Elisha's shoulders. This was a symbol of like a passing of identity, of saying like, look, who I am, I'm putting on you. It was, it was him very literally like passing the torch to be like, you are going to be my successor. You're going to walk with the same identity I walked with. And he puts his cloak on him. And at first you see Elisha be like, let me go back and kiss my mother and father. And but then when he goes back, he says, El Elijah tells him, think about what I've done to you. And when he goes back, he kills his oxen, uh, roasts it and feeds everyone with it and uses his plow as fire uh, to cook with. So he completely destroyed the way back to his old life. Like the resources he had to do his old job, gone. It's like the missionaries you hear about in, old, in, uh, in history where they would uh, go somewhere to tell people about Jesus and like they'd row ashore and like burn the boats. It's like that, like there's no going back. This is my calling, this is my new life. And Elisha walked with Elijah as his assistant and he learned about how to walk in relationship with God and how to hear his voice. He walked alongside him as his assistant and learned about being a prophet. And then eventually the time comes for Elijah to be taken up into heaven which is this amazing story. He didn't actually die. He was taken up into heaven. And the time is coming for this where Elisha is going to be left on his own. And it's interesting when he, they, what happens is they are going to the area where Elijah is going to be taken up to heaven. And on the way across the river, Elijah hits the water with his cloak. The water parts and they cross together. And then Elijah says to him in 1 Kings 2, 9, he says, tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. So Elisha asks, let me inherit a double portion of, of your spirit, like the way that God rests on you and works through you, let me have double of that. Now, Elijah was the one who spoke with God on the mountain, who called down fire from heaven, who stood up to the king, who prayed and drought and rain happened, who, the guy who aunt, outran horses. And Elisha's like, I want double the spirit of God in me that you have which is a crazy, faith-filled thing to ask for. But after Elijah's taken up into heaven, the only thing that's left behind is Elijah's cloak, the same one he put over Elisha's shoulders when he called him. And Elisha picks up his cloak, walks back over to the river, and says, where is the God of Elijah? And hits the water and the water parts to show that now God was, going, was with him. 
and like his, his request had been answered. And through the power of God working through him, we see amazing things. We see water provided to save an army in the wilderness. We see um, the dead raised. We see people with leprosy healed. We see um, at the end, just like the song uh, that says, just ask the man who was thrown on the bones of Elijah if there's anything that God can't do. like. There was literally a man thrown into Elijah's tomb where his bones were and when he, he was dead and when he hit Elijah's bones, he came back to life. Like God's spirit was so with him. But the thing about Elijah and Elisha both that made their story so incredible is that they were all in for God. And as a result, God was with them. They couldn't have done anything they did if not for God's spirit with them. I want to read 2 Kings in 2 Kings 6 here. So in 2 Kings 6, what happens is there's a king plotting to go to war with Israel. And every time he makes a plan, Elisha goes and tells the king what the enemy king's plan is. And the king's wondering, like, is there a traitor among us? How does Israel know all our plans? And his men tell him, like, no, they have a prophet named Elisha that knows everything you're going to do. He knows the things you whisper in secret and is telling the king um, because God is with him. And so they send this army after Elisha. And Elisha and the man who was his assistant are standing there and his assistant's afraid. And in verse 16, it says, Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than on theirs. So then Elisha prayed, O oh Lord, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. And what happens is this army that came after Elisha was actually blinded, and Elisha brought them to the king of Israel as like, follow me and they're blind like what else are they gonna do so they don't know where to go so he says follow me and he actually takes them to the king of israel the king of israel is like should i kill them like they're the enemy army and and he says no like is that how you treat prisoners of war feed them and send them home and after that that army left israel alone and actually brought some needed peace but the point that's so significant here is that god was with elisha even when a literal army came against him, he was able to say, you know, you don't have any reason to be afraid because the ones with us are greater than the ones against us. Look at that, that faith. But what would have happened if Elisha was too concerned about his oxen to go follow the calling God had given him. What if he would have been like, do you know what? I have this really good job going on right now. Like I'm, I'm really doing well, like plowing the fields. I have these oxen that are great. I just don't think it would be a wise decision. I, I mean, you're calling in, me into something completely unknown. Like what if he would have just stayed? But in order to give his life fully to God and step into the calling God was giving him, he had to be willing to leave everything behind. And how worth it was it? How much more amazing did his life end up being? But the question I have for you today is what are your oxen? Maybe it sounds like a funny question. But really, God's calling you into something. He's calling you to be who he made you to be, into the purpose that he designed for your life. What are the oxen in your life? What's your plow that needs to be left behind, that needs to be burned? What is that thing from your old life that you're holding on to? A sense of freedom? Or fear of the unknown? What is the yes that you need to say to become who you were made to be? God is faithful. If we give ourselves fully to, fully to him, he will never leave us. And when challenges rise in our lives, 
When we have an enemy that comes against us, we can know that the armies of heaven are literally by our side and we have no reason to fear. But first, we have to say the yes to being all in, nothing held back in our relationship with God. So we're gonna spend some time in prayer. But these are the two questions I have for you. One, what do you need to leave behind and be done with for good? What needs to get burned, sacrificed, done? Two, what faith step do you need to say yes to in order to fully step into who God is calling you to be? We're gonna spend some time to just pray and reflect and send us a message with your answer to this. Click on, there's a link coming up right now. Click on that and, and tell us your answer to this question. We wanna walk alongside you. We wanna pray with you. And we wanna help equip you to take the steps that you need to take. Let's pray. I hope you all had a great time in prayer. And like I said earlier, we have an announcement to share with you all about this coming Sunday. I have Heather here with me. Mm -hmm. Heather, why don't you tell us what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've got another Bold Love Sunday coming up next week. It's going to be really awesome. We're just meeting at the Klopfenstein's house and we're packing a whole lot of bags to help our unhoused neighbor neighbors over in Pioneer Square. That's going to be along with Reach Ministries. They do this phenomenal thing. So I'm really excited. We're going to get everyone together and just have a great time um, serving our community. It's going to be awesome. And then on Saturday after that, November 6th, we're going to be going over to Pioneer Square to meet with them and serve and directly talk to the communities that they serve on a daily basis as well. So it's going to be a really awesome 
opportunity for all of us. This is gonna be really exciting and what a great way to put our faith into action, to put that bold love into mm -hmm. action, to tangibly yep. love others. Mm -hmm. Thank you for organizing this. Yeah, uh, It's no gonna be really good. This is so key to the culture of our church. I hope every one of you can get involved. Uh, so this Sunday, at our house um, and we'll send out another email this week with with details reminders you can click the link coming up right now mm -hmm. for more information more details um, and then that following Saturday we get to actually go out and serve those that we made bags for and those mm -hmm. that we prayed for um, on the 31st so uh, what we're building are these bags with supplies for our unhoused neighbors mm -hmm. so um, we're estimating that these bags will cost about $10 a piece. We would love to be able to make 80 of them, 20 for kids that our courageous kids will be making and 60 for the adults. And we're gonna put time and thought and attention into these, write notes to go into them. We're gonna pray over them, but we would love to raise $800 to be able to do 80 or 80 bags. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you for those of you who are already given yeah, thank towards you so this. Much. Uh, if you're planning on contributing, uh, thank you. We ask if you could do that today, that would be awesome. That way we know our budget and we can go out <laughs> yeah. shopping for uh -huh. our neighbors this week. Uh -huh. uh, but we're really looking forward to serving with you all this coming weekend. The link to give uh, is coming up right now. And just select in the the menu, there's our main fund and then there's bold love events. Just click bold love events. We'll know that's where you're sending that donation. Um, but let's come together as a church, live generously and bless our neighbors. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. Thank you guys so much for your support already on this. We hope to see you there. Thank you so much.